Hey guys, welcome to my YouTube channel. In this video, we're going to be talking about cellular adaptations to stress. Now, what doesn't kill your cells makes them adapt. And in this video, we will be diving into the various types of cellular adaptations that tissues may undergo in order to adapt to a change in stress. So, when a cell experiences stress, the cell can undergo adaptation to this specific stress. We'll look into hyperplasia, hypertrophy, atrophy, metaplasia, as well as the more pathological adaptations, dysplasia and neoplasia. Now, our tissues and cells can't adapt to all the types of stress or all severities of stress. And so, if the stress is too severe, then the stress may injure our cells. We will be looking into cellular injury in a lot more detail in my next video. So, what exactly do we mean by stress? In this context, stress is anything that affects the functioning capacity of cells, tissues, organs, or even organ systems. Examples of stress include physical agents such as heat, radiation, or trauma, impaired nutrient supply, chemical or microbial agents, as well as genetic impairments that influence metabolism. So, what amount of stress causes our cells to adapt? And how much more stress before our cells get injured? This really depends on the type of stress, the severity of the stress, and the type of tissue that's affected. Now, the type of tissue affected is an obvious one. Your skin cells will respond differently to, for example, your stomach lining. And the type of stress is also important. For example, your stomach will be fine with acid, but the same acid will damage your skin. Furthermore, the severity of the stress is important. For example, your skin is pretty good at dealing with sunlight. However, you still can get sunburnt if the sunlight exposure is too much. Okay. Enough with the rambling. Let's get into cellular adaptation. These are the notes I'll be using for this tutorial. And as usual, you can find the link in the description box below. Just make sure you support the channel by hitting the like and subscribe button on your way. So, cellular adaptations are a response to stress. So first, let's look at what happens when the stress is increased. When cells experience increased stress, they can undergo hyperplasia and or hypertrophy. Hypertrophy is an increase in cell size, and this is achieved by an increase in structural proteins and increase in the number of organelles. Hyperplasia, on the other hand, as the name suggests, hyper meaning increased, plasia meaning proliferation, is a regulated increase in the number of cells. Hyperplasia is a regulated process, and this is an important distinction when we're comparing it to neoplasia, which we will discuss just now. Hyperplasia and hypertrophy normally occur together since they are both a response to an increase in stress. However, there is an exception to this, and this exception is permanent tissues. Now, permanent tissues, for example, skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle, and nerves, can only undergo hypertrophy, and this is because they are not able to divide. Now, it's important to note that hyperplasia and hypertrophy are easily reversible. And so, if you remove the stress, the cells will return to normal. Hyperplasia is regulated, meaning that it's a response to a stimulus. And excessive stimulation can lead to pathological hyperplasia. This pathological hyperplasia may progress to dysplasia or cancer. However, it's important to note that there is an exception to this general rule of pathology. And that is benign prostatic hyperplasia. Benign prostatic hyperplasia does not increase the risk of prostatic carcinoma. So, benign prostatic hyperplasia will not progress to dysplasia or neoplasia. We will discuss dysplasia and cancer in just a moment. But first, let's look at atrophy and metaplasia. We've looked at increased stress. Now, let's have a look at what happens when the stress is decreased. Our cells respond to a decrease in stress by atrophy. Atrophy is basically a reduction in cell number and cell size. This is sort of the opposite of hyperplasia and hypertrophy. Now, the reduced stress could be a result of disuse, loss of blood supply, loss of hormonal stimulation, or poor nutrition. Now, your cells need energy to stay alive. And so, if you remove the stress, for example, you stop going to the gym, then your body doesn't need those huge muscles that take up so much energy. And so, to save energy, these muscles will undergo atrophy. Another example is if you can't provide your cells with the required energy, for example, with poor nutrition or reduced blood supply. Now, if we want that tissue to stay alive, then we need to reduce the energy requirements, and so that tissue will undergo atrophy. So how exactly do our cells undergo atrophy? First of all, we have apoptosis, which is programmed cell death, and this leads to the reduction in the number of cells. Next, we need to reduce the cell size. And to achieve this, we need a reduction in the number of proteins and organelles. Proteins are degraded via the ubiquitin pathway, where proteins are tagged by ubiquitin for degradation. Proteasomes and lysosomes then degrade these tagged proteins. Now, to reduce the number of organelles, our body produces autophagosomes around organelles. And these autophagosomes will fuse with lysosomes to break down the organelle. Now, 
This process is known as autophagy, meaning self-eating. There's two more processes that are related to a reduction in stress, and these occur during embryogenesis. Firstly, we have aplasia, meaning no proliferation, and we have hyperplasia, meaning reduced cell proliferation. So, if we say you have renal aplasia, it means that one of your kidneys was not developed at all. And if we say you have renal hyperplasia, then one of your kidneys is underdeveloped. We've looked at how cells respond to an increase in stress and a decrease in stress. Now, how do cells respond to a change in the type of stress? This is where metaplasia comes in. Metaplasia is caused by the reprogramming of a stem cell. And this is where one adult cell type is replaced by another adult cell type. And this is usually as a result of exposure to an irritant. For example, cigarette smoke or stomach acid with the case of gastroesophageal reflux disease. With cigarette smoking, ciliated columna epithelium of the respiratory tract changes to stratified squamous epithelium, which is better equipped to deal with the irritants in the cigarette smoke. Now, on this histology diagram, we can clearly see that these columna epithelium that are ciliated gradually changes to stratified squamous epithelium. And you can see these squamous cells here. Now, the second example is Barrett's esophagus, and this is caused by gastroesophageal reflux disease. Here, stratified squamous epithelium of the esophagus is exposed to acid from the stomach due to reflux. And so, it changes to non-ciliated mucinous columna epithelium because this epithelium produces mucus, which is better equipped to dealing with the acid from the stomach. Now, metaplasia, like pathological hyperplasia, can progress to dysplasia or neoplasia. For example, Barrett's esophagus can progress to esophageal adenocarcinoma. However, there's also an exception to this rule, and it is apocrine metaplasia of the breast. Apocrine metaplasia of the breast leads to no increase in the risk of breast cancer. Now, let's have a look at dysplasia. Dysplasia is a proliferation of precancerous cells. The most important distinction between dysplasia and neoplasia, and what really makes dysplasia precancerous and not cancerous, is that dysplasia is still reversible. So what do we really see under histology? First of all, we have pleomorphism. And this is a variation in size and shape of cells. In this image, you can see that we have these huge cells here, these are massive cells. And we also have these tiny cells here. Next, cells in a tissue have a certain orientation. For example, cells that line the lumen of the GIT have an apical and a basal side. And with dysplasia, this orientation is lost. And finally, we can observe several nuclear changes, and the most important being an increase in nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio. And we can clearly see this in this diagram that I've drawn. You can see that the ratio between the nucleus and the cytoplasm is largely increased, especially when we compare it to normal cells. Dysplasia can originate from hyperplasia, metaplasia, or even directly from normal cells. However, let me emphasize that dysplasia is precancerous because it is still reversible. And so, if you remove the stress, the cells may progress back to normal. If the stress persists, then dysplasia may progress to neoplasia. Okay, so in this video, I've used the terms neoplasia and cancer interchangeably. However, there is a distinction. So, before we move forward, let's clarify some terms. Firstly, we have tumor. Tumor refers to any swelling or growth. And I know that tumor is generally used to refer to cancer. However, a tumor could be any sort of swelling or growth, which could be abnormal with regards to neoplasia or normal, for example, with enlarged lymph nodes due to an infection. Now, neoplasia literally means new growth. And this new growth is unregulated, irreversible, and monoclonal. Remember, hyperplasia and hypertrophy are also growths, but they're not neoplasia. And this is because they are regulated. Neoplasia, on the other hand, is unregulated and does not depend on any sort of stimulus or stress. And this is what makes it irreversible. And this is in contrast with all the other forms of cellular adaptations. Metaplasia because of smoking will reverse once you remove the stress, i.e. stop smoking. Hypertrophy will reverse once you stop going to the gym. And even dysplasia is reversible. However, neoplasia is irreversible. Now, the final property of neoplasia is monoclonality. This means that all the cells in a neoplasm originate from one damaged cell, which divides uncontrollably until a tumor is formed. In our case, a neoplasm. Now, this growth can be divided into benign or malignant. We will be looking into benign and malignant neoplasms in a lot more detail in another video, but cancers are basically the malignant form of neoplasms. This means that all cancers are neoplasms, but not all neoplasms are cancers, because there's also the benign form. Now, tumors are any swelling or growth, meaning that all neoplasms 
are tumours. However, not all tumours are neoplasms because for a tumour to be a neoplasm, it needs to have these three properties. Neoplasia can originate from dysplasia, metaplasia, hyperplasia or directly from normal cells. Okay, that's all for cellular adaptation. Make sure you check up my next video on cellular injury, which is what happens when a cell can't adapt to stress. All right, thanks for watching. If you guys found this video useful, make sure you smash the like button or just gently tap it, it's up to you. Also, make sure you share this video with anyone that will find this video useful. Feel free to leave any questions in the comment box below and make sure you guys subscribe and hit the bell icon so you don't miss out on any future videos. This is the Caffeinated Medic signing off. Till next time, take care.